give people a minute to Okay, welcome everyone to another episode of Science Demystified with Dr. Joe Schwartz. Hey everyone, uh, nice of you to be inside on a summer day and we will try to make it worth your while with the story of plastics. Now I've spoken to you about plastics in many different uh, connections before. Uh, today I'm going to focus in on, on, on history and the early beginnings. I, I just find it fascinating. And uh, I first encountered plastics, believe it or not, in a very interesting fashion. It was through a comic character, and that was Plastic Man. Uh, I collected comics uh, when I was uh, young. I had all kinds of comics. I, I, I foolishly gave a lot of them away when uh, just after I graduated high school when, you know, I thought I was too old for comics. And uh, boy, do I ever regret that because I had a lot of, of comics that, that were probably, you know, quite valuable. I had a lot of Superman comics. Anyway, I did have um, a, a version of uh, police comics in which uh, Plastic Man was uh, introduced. And he was a very interesting uh, character. This. Uh, this takes us back to 1941. And the story was about a guy called Eel O'Brien, unusual name, who fell into an unnamed vat of acid. And uh, he was attempting to rob a chemical company. And he fell into this vat of acid and that made him into plastic man. And then he became a crime fighter. And that really was my first uh, encounter with, uh, with plastics. I didn't think a whole lot of it uh, until 1964, when I went to the New York World's Fair. And boy, was that ever a, a great event. And uh, that was also my, uh, my first trip to New York, first trip to Yankee Stadium. Uh, it was just great. And by 1964, uh, I mean, I was in high school, but I had become very interested in chemistry already. So I was looking forward to visiting the DuPont Pavilion, which was entitled The Wonderful World of Chemistry. And in those days, nobody had any qualms about the word wonderful being related to, to chemistry. And inside, uh, there were all kinds of exhibits uh, and uh, there was even a show it was a Broadway kind of show uh, about the happy plastics family. And the actors and actresses danced around. They, they sang about uh, plastics. It was, you know, a neat little song. There's nothing to match a thousand things you do with plastics. There's nothing to beat their skill and versatility. That's why we can tell you we're all enthusiastic about the very significant, truly magnificent, happy plastics family. And they spoke about nylon, they spoke about polyesters and all the products that were being produced by, by DuPont. And uh, the audience really appreciated this because they, there was not, nothing negative about plastics or chemicals in, in those days. One thing I do remember is that they made a point about uh, a new type of shoe that DuPont was introducing uh, made of Corfam. And this was going to be a replacement for leather because it would wear longer, it, it would uh, be cleaned more easily. Uh, actually it turned out that that was not all that successful. People didn't want shoes made of plastic. They wanted uh, leather shoes and they didn't want shoes that lasted forever because they wanted to change with the styles. But in any case, back in 1964, plastics were flying high. Uh, people certainly appreciated all the things that they could do. Uh, in fact, in, in uh, Disneyland in California, there was the Monsanto House of the Future and everything in it was made of plastic and tourists flocked to, to see this. It was really quite fascinating, you know, and. This was, of course, novel in those days. Plastic was a, a revolutionary new material. 
uh, easy to clean, durable. It was great. Nobody spoke about this in any kind of a negative fashion. And that, of course, was illustrated by um, the classic scene in The Graduate, 1967, uh, one of the great movies uh, of all time. It uh, introduced Dustin Hoffman. And I'm sure many of you saw this movie and you remember that scene when uh, young uh, uh, ben Benjamin just graduates from university. His parents hold a party for him. And during that party, he's corralled by a family friend who uh, puts his arms around him and he says, Ben, there's just one thing I want you to remember because Ben, of course, is thinking about what career to pursue. And he whispers to him, plastics. Now, of course, in those days, uh, that was a very good career path because plastics were being manufactured on large scale. They were absolutely everywhere. And people were very happy with the, all the plastics that were produced. That's very interesting because you contrast that today to what is going on. And people are saying no to plastic. They want to eliminate plastics, etc. That, of course, is a totally nonsensical <laughs> idea uh, because obviously we do have issues, especially with single-use plastics. And we have issues about uh, plastics not being recycled with uh, frequency. However, to say that we should get rid of no to plastics is, is just nonsense. Uh, <laughs> plastics are everywhere, or cars, or airplanes made of plastics. Hospitals could not function without plastic. Anyway, let's uh, ask the question, what does it really mean? What is a plastic? The word plastic is not new. In fact, it was around in the 1600s when it was used to talk about any material that could be shaped and which would then uh, hold on to the form into which it had been shaped. So the plastics were materials that could be molded. And uh, the, you know, classic example would be clay. You could mold it and then fire it and it will hold it, its shape. So basically, plastics are materials that can be molded or extruded into objects, into films, filaments, and that will then retain their shape. So indeed, clay uh, is a plastic material because it can be shaped. Uh, there are other natural such plastic materials, for example, pitch. Uh, this is the, this uh, uh, pretty ugly black material that you get when you heat wood and uh, it drips out of the wood as it's being uh, heated. Now, pitch is, is impervious to water. And historically, it has been used to waterproof uh, sailing vessels and ships. If you take a look at the story of Noah from the Bible, uh, you will know that uh, he used pitch in order to waterproof the ark. And there you can see the bucket of pitch that uh, he is ready to, to use. And uh, pitch can be molded and it will retain its, uh, its final shape. So it was a plastic material. Now, chemically speaking, plastics are composed of what we call polymers. These are giant molecules that are made up of individual units. The classic analogy is the links in a chain. Well, the individual units of which these polymers are composed are called monomers. And uh, when you join these together into a long chain, we have a polymer, which of course then has totally different properties from the original raw material, the monomer. Well, let's start out with the notion that, that there are natural polymers, which do not require the hand of, of humans. These are giant molecules created by nature. And of course, you're familiar with these, silk and fur and hide and horn and flax and cotton, wool, wood. These are all natural polymers. In the case of silk, case of fur, hide and horn, 
uh, we're talking about proteins, giant molecules of amino acids joined together. Wool is also a protein. On the other hand, uh, wood and cotton are made of cellulose, which we'll have a lot to, to say uh, about. Uh, so is the fiber in flax made out of uh, uh, cellulose. So, but these are giant molecules. In the case of the proteins, the individual units are amino acids. In the case of uh, wood and cotton and flax, the individual units are, are glucose. We have a long history of using these natural polymers. Now, polymers are not necessarily plastics. Wood, of course, is a polymer, but it is not, not a plastic. Horn, on the other hand, is a plastic because you can heat it up, you can shape it, and then it will retain its, uh, its shape. Uh, there are all kinds of artifacts historically that have been made of these natural materials. For example, this uh, knife, which has a horn handle, for example. Another interesting case of a natural uh, polymer, a resinous material that is produced by little insects that live on a tree. And the material that we're talking about here that is produced as they suck the sap out of the tree and convert it into a, a polymer. And this is shellac. Now shellac is a, a plastic material because you can heat it up, you can pour it into a mold and it will retain the shape. The original records were made of shellac uh, and then eventually they were switched to polyvinyl chloride but the original material was made of, uh, of shellac, a natural polymer. Another natural polymer is gutta percha. Uh, this is an exudate of a tree, mostly in Indonesia and um, when it hardens, it can be formed, uh, for example, into golf balls. The original golf balls were made of uh, gutta percha. More famous than that is the sap that oozes out from the Hevea brasiliensis tree. And this, of course, is what we know as natural rubber. Natural rubber was known to indigenous people long before Europeans appeared in America. They had uses for it. They learned how to take it, uh, boil it, and uh, then use it for apparel. They would stick their feet into it. They would have some primitive galoshes. Uh, so it was a very useful material. It was introduced into Europe. Nobody had a real big use for it, uh, except Joseph Priestley. And uh, now Joseph Priestley, you may have heard of as the inventor or the discoverer of oxygen, but he also found that this new material that was being imported from South America was very useful in rubbing out the marks made by a lead pencil. And he named this new material rubber. And of course, we still use that expression. But the most famous scientist in connection with the use of rubber is undoubtedly Charles Goodyear. Now, although rubber was a very useful material, it was also difficult to work with because in the summer, uh, it would get very, very soft. In the winter, it would get very, very hard. And Goodyear wanted to find a way to improve the properties of rubber. And he tried mixing it with all sorts of substances. These range from things like soup to cream cheese. And then one day there was a happy accident. He spilled some of his rubber mixture on his stove where he had also previously spilled some sulfur. And the rubber and the sulfur under the influence of heat reacted and changed into a novel material with different properties. He called the novel material vulcanized rubber after Vulcan, the Roman god of fire, because those fire that had caused this chemical change. Well, chemically speaking, we know that rubber is made of long molecules. These are the polymers. And when you add sulfur to it, the sulfur cross links those long molecules 
to form this three-dimensional network. And because of the crosslinks, this now becomes a very elastic material. You can stretch it, but those sulfur crosslinks will pull it back into the original shape when you let go. Anyway, Goodyear patented uh, his, uh, his discovery. And uh, in uh, 1851, he got a lot of attention when he exhibited his vulcanized rubber at the Crystal Palace exhibition in London. This was a huge uh, exhibit. The Crystal Palace was a wonderful building. Uh, as you can see in the top here, it was uh, mostly made of, of glass, very, very unusual at the time. And inside there were all kinds of exhibits of novel materials, novel uh, technological processes. And that included Goodyear's Vulcanite Court, where all sorts of rubber items were on exhibit. For example, this rubber pontoon, this large boat made of, of rubber. There were also on display uh, dice made of rubber, uh, various kind of brooches like the butterfly here made of, uh, of rubber. And the, the public was absolutely astonished by all these items that could be made from uh, rubber. Uh, Goodyear also, believe it or not, made the first ever soccer ball. And here it is, a little bit deflated, but there, there, that's the original uh, uh, soccer ball made of vulcanized uh, rubber. Uh, today, soccer balls are, are really technological miracles. Several different layers of, of uh, polymers are, are, are used, but the original one was made of vulcanized rubber. There is an item that is very familiar to us here in Canada that is still made of vulcanized rubber, basically the same vulcanized rubber that Goodyear had uh, accidentally discovered. And that, of course, is the hockey puck. Hockey pucks uh, are obviously mass produced, made of vulcanized rubber. And uh, they do have a certain degree of elasticity to them which you don't want in, in hockey. And that's why the pucks are frozen before a game to make them less, uh, less bouncy. But in order to make them hard, which of course is what you really need, they, it has to be made of vulcanized rubber. So you need the sulfur holding those polymers together. Vulcanized rubber today, of course, has many other uses. Uh, one of the prime uses, obviously, is the manufacture of, of tires. And uh, tires are generally a blend today of uh, vulcanized rubber, uh, the old fashioned type. But there are also some synthetic rubbers today that are, are uh, uh, used in tire manufacture. We run into a problem with tires. One of the problems, of course, is when the rubber hits the road. And as you can imagine, I mean, it's quite obvious when that rubber rubs against the road, tiny particles come off. Now, those particles are so small that they generally are, are invisible, but we know that this happens because obviously tires will wear away. So you have to ask the question, where did all of that rubber from the wear go? The answer is into the environment. And this is a lot of rubber that gets into the uh, environment. And this is not really uh, very pleasing because uh, for various reasons, of course, those uh, tiny, tiny particles get airborne, they can be inhaled. So they, they are part of uh, air pollution. And as you know, there are all kinds of studies about how there are more cases of lung disease, heart disease in areas where the air is, is polluted. And also the uh, modern day uh, rubber is uh, produced with carbon disulfide. That is the rubber is first dissolved in carbon disulfide. It is then poured into molds. That's how tires are, are manufactured. And there's always a residue of carbon disulfide, which is a toxic substance. So although, I mean, obviously tires are totally necessary, we can't live without them, there is a price to pay. Uh, because we are exposed to the breakdown products of, of, of rubber. All right. Well, 
that's the, the story of some of the natural uh, polymers and some of which are plastics. But what we are really interested in uh, as, you know, as chemists is the manipulation of natural substances to make substances that didn't exist before. And, you know, uh, chemistry is defined as the study of matter and the changes that matter undergoes. And we're always looking for novel changes. We're looking to synthesize new drugs, new, new cosmetics, new plastics. Uh, we want to, of course, make these in an environmentally friendly fashion. So these days, of course, we're looking to manufacture substances out of renewable materials. That is, we would rather not use uh, petroleum, even though petroleum is very useful for raw materials to be converted to all kinds of, of items. But petroleum, of course, is a non-renewable resource. We will eventually run out of it. When that will happen, uh, nobody knows because, uh, you know, um, geologists are constantly finding new areas where there is uh, oil uh, underneath the ground or underneath the, the ocean. But the fact is that the earth is of a finite size. And therefore, eventually we will run out of petroleum because we're not making any more of it. Petroleum is the end result of the decomposition of, of vegetative and animal life over billions of years. So we will run out. So we're constantly searching for renewable sources of substances from which to make our uh, materials that we need, whether they be drugs, cosmetics, or indeed plastics. Cellulose is uh, one of the best candidates for use to make substances that are renewable because cellulose is abundant in the world. It is a biopolymer, meaning that it's made by living systems. In fact, cellulose is found in all plants. This is what makes up the cell walls of plants. It is the most abundant material in the world. Now, cellulose is a polymer. It is a polymer composed of individual units of glucose. This is where glucose is the monomer and cellulose is the polymer. But cellulose is not a plastic. However, it can be used to make plastics. And the modern story of manufactured plastics starts with quests to modify cellulose. Now, cellulose is abundant in wood. Wood pulp is a major source and cotton is a major source. Cotton, like wood, is composed of uh, glucose units linked together, but there's a difference between cotton and wood. Cotton is almost pure cellulose. Wood is mostly cellulose, but there are many other components in wood as well. Lignin is a sticky substance that binds the cellulose together. And uh, handling wood is more difficult than, than working with cellulose because usually you have to get rid of the lignin to isolate the cellulose. Cotton, however, is pure cellulose. Now, the manipulation of cotton uh, towards plastics takes us back to 1833 when Henri Braconneau, a French chemist, found that when he took cotton and he reacted it with nitric acid, he formed a novel material. He called it xyloidine. Today we know what it is, nitrocellulose. He didn't know that. He just knew that he mixed up cotton with nitric acid and uh, it transformed into a new material. Didn't know what it was, but he made a very, very important observation. This new material, which we know is nitrocellulose, was extremely flammable. He didn't do very much with it, except to note that he had made this new material, which was highly uh, flammable. Unfortunately, he didn't pursue this uh, any, any further. 
The breakthrough, however, came uh, just uh, 12 years later in 1845. Christian Schambein was an accomplished professor of chemistry in, uh, in Switzerland, but he would sometimes work at home. Even before COVID, sometimes people worked at home. And uh, he was very interested in, uh, in cotton and uh, his work involved treating cotton with nitric acid and sulfuric acid. He was uh, familiar, of course, with the uh, work of Braconneau. He was trying to, to further it. And uh, as the story goes, one day he was working in his kitchen at home and he happened to spill the mixture of nitric acid and sulfuric acid. He had to wipe this up. Luckily for him, Frau Schönbein was not home at the time. So he grabbed his wife's apron, which happened to be made of cotton, and he wiped up the mess on the floor. But then he had this wet apron on his hands. He had to do something about it. So he hung it up in front of the fireplace to dry. And the next thing he realized was that that apron went up in a flame, but critically without producing any smoke. So basically he had recre recreated Braconneau's original observation. The difference here was that he was able to capitalize on it. He didn't just leave this alone. Now today we know what happened here. The mixture of sulfuric acid and nitric acid reacted with the cellulose by placing an NO2 group on each oxygen on this long molecule. This is what made it extremely flammable because the combustion process requires the presence of a material that burns, but also requires the presence of oxygen. Now, most of the time that oxygen is supplied by oxygen from the air. However, if the material has its own supply of oxygen, as is provided here by those NO2 groups, then it will burn with uh, extreme vigor. So Schumbein noticed that this material burned extremely vigorously and that it produced no smoke. That eventually would lead him to the development of smokeless gunpowder, which was a huge breakthrough in those days because it was much better than the old fashioned gunpowder that was made of sulfur, charcoal and saltpeter. That would leave a cloud of smoke hanging over the head of a soldier who had used it in their weapon. And in those days, of course, you had to reload each time and the giveaway cloud of smoke would tell the enemy where the gun had been fired from. Now, Schumbein also made another interesting observation. Uh, along with Louis Nicolas Menard, independently, they found that this material that they had made, gun cotton, dissolved in a solution of ether and alcohol, and it formed a, a, a thick, gluey solution that they named collodion, from the Greek word for glue, because it, it was this thick syrup. Interestingly enough, when the solvent, the ether alcohol evaporated, it left behind a layer of plastic. This really was a plastic. It was a material that could be heated. I would soften it, and then it could be molded into a shape. And Schönbein wrote to Michael Faraday, at that time, perhaps the leading scientist in the world, that he was able to shape his cellulose nitrate materials into all sorts of things and forms. And that was it, he left it at that. He did not pursue this any further because he was more interested in pursuing the fact that gun cotton, as it came to be called, burned without producing any smoke. So he was more interested in producing smokeless gunpowder than in the plasticity of the cellulose nitrate he had uh, created. A physician in Boston, John Parker, found another interesting use for this material, collodion. 
he found that it was an excellent coating for cuts. It would leave a plastic film over the cut and protect it from the air. And such uh, liquid collodion is still available today, uh, although it is not extensively used. Now, the first really practical use of this material collodion uh, was by Frederick Archer in the US who used it in the photographic process. This was an excellent material to coat photographic plates in which the silver compounds that were needed for light sensitivity were embedded. These photographers, and in those days they would travel around in a van, which also served as their darkroom, made extensive use of collodion. So a glass plate would be coated with collodion in which the, the silver salts were uh, embedded and uh, the image would be produced and the images were surprisingly good. Here is one. This is President Teddy Roosevelt. And this was one of the photographs that was made using collodion, which had been discovered uh, as, as I uh, mentioned by uh, uh, Menard and by uh, uh, Schembein. Uh, today, collodion has one very, very interesting use. It is used by makeup artists for uh, uh, film production. Whenever you need uh, to make skin look like it has been somehow injured, uh, they use collodion because it makes the skin pucker and it looks like there's a scar there. Very interesting, but rather unusual use for uh, collodion. However, the man who did find the first really, really practical use as far as plastics go for collodion was Alexander Parks in England. Alexander Parks had heard about Schumbein's work. Schumbein had actually patented his discovery uh, of how he had taken cotton and mixed it with nitric and sulfuric acid and converted it into smokeless gunpowder. But Parks wasn't interested in the smokeless gunpowder aspect. He was interested in the other finding that Schumbein had made that when his substance was dissolved in an alcohol ether mixture and the solvent evaporated, a plastic film was left behind. This is what Parks began to experiment with. And in 1855, he found that when he took collodion, mixed it with vegetable oil, which allowed it to be even more malleable, he could harden it into a material that he called Parkesine, obviously after his own name. And this really was the world's first plastic. He was able to make some very interesting materials out of uh, Parkesine. And you can see them here. These are really historic items. A fishing reel, jewelry, see the bangle there, uh, artificial teeth, and the handles of, of the knives. Parkesine could also be colored. So you can imagine that it was a huge hit when it was exhibited at the London International Exhibition of 1862. This was just 11 years after Goodyear had captivated audiences there with his vulcanized rubber. But now it was the turn of Alexander Parks who introduced really the world's first plastic. And uh, he got a prize at this exhibit. Uh, he was awarded a bronze medal uh, for his uh, display of Parkesine. And interestingly enough, he then took that medal and he made a mold out of it. And then he, he filled that mold with Parkesine. So he reproduced that bronze medal in Parkesine. Pretty interesting. And Alexander Parks uh, is uh, remembered, uh, certainly in England, as the inventor of the first plastic. 
And as you can see, uh, there is a marker on the house where he uh, uh, carried out his, his work. He uh, had many helpers. Uh, once he, he founded a company to manufacture uh, Parkinson, one of which was Daniel Spill, who carried on the work uh, of Parks. And he improved on Parkinson and he called his improved material uh, xylonite. Xylonite was uh, uh, commercially produced. Here is a xylonite factory in, uh, in England. And uh, basically he was producing the same kind of things, plastic items that Parks has, had uh, produced. And he was able to bring down the price. So, so the, the first plastic items sold uh, quite well. Now at the same time in the United States, John Wesley Hyatt made a discovery uh, whether it was independent or not, as you'll see in a minute, uh, is, is debatable. But here is the, the, the story as is usually told in America. The Colander Billiard Company, makers of billiard tables and billiard balls, offered a prize of $10,000 to anyone who could come up with a substitute for ivory. Ivory, of course, was from the uh, tusks of elephants. And because of all of the poaching, ivory had become in short supply. So the word went out to find a substitute because billiard balls were made of ivory and the company needed something to replace ivory because there wasn't enough ivory around. And this is when John Wesley Hyatt stepped up and found that when he mixed collodion with camphor, he produced a material that he called celluloid. Now, essentially, this was the same as Parkesine. Now, whether or not John Wesley Hyatt knew about Park's work, uh, as I said, is, is debatable. But it's conceivable that both of them had kind of, you know, arrived at the same idea of mixing collodion with something to, uh, to make a, a plastic. Uh, Parks called it Parkesine and Hyatt called it celluloid. He actually managed to make a billiard ball out of uh, his uh, new invention out of celluloid. But as you can imagine, there was a little issue with this billiard ball because it turned out that when uh, the first billiard balls were introduced, uh, some of the men discovered that if they hit the balls very hard, they would explode with a bang. Because of course, celluloid was made of nitrocellulose, which was an explosive material. And uh, the word was that, that uh, you know, uh, there were cases where these billiard balls would uh, you know, make come up with a mild explosion and uh, people thought that there was gunfire because uh, of this. Uh, I would not say you know, that this, this was an epidemic of exploding billiard balls, but it was a problem. Uh, it wasn't exactly the same as ivory. Ivory, of course, had no chance of, of, of ignition. But in any case, Hyatt did found the Albany Billiard Ball Company. And uh, these billiard balls made of celluloid uh, were, were produced. And uh, no, it was a going concern. They produced a, a lot of these and it sold well. Now, interesting enough, uh, the US also has a commemorative plaque of the first plastic. As you can see, celluloid invented in 1868. But the fact is that Alexander Parks, as I said, in England, uh, years earlier, had already exhibited his Parkesine, which was essentially the same. I mean, they were both based on, on uh, collodion. It was just a question of what the collodion was mixed with. Uh, I, I guess we can give credit to both of them. Uh, we'll never know whether, you know, just how much John Wesley Hyatt knew of what was going on in that time. I mean, obviously communication then was not what it is today. 
uh, especially uh, about substances that were you know patented is the secret processes but anyway uh, what we do know is that john wesley hyatt uh, uh, created the celluloid company built a factory in new jersey where he started to produce all sorts of items out of uh, celluloid very pretty items as you can see combs and brushes and and shoehorns and they actually did resemble ivory so celluloid became a very very popular uh, material one of the most interesting items made of celluloid were these waterproof collars and shirt cuffs uh, these could be just rinsed off in water and cleaned and this was a big advantage in those days because gentlemen believe it or not did not change their shirts every day they didn't need to they wore vests to cover it anyway but the collars showed and the cuffs showed so those were uh, replaced every day and at first it was linen but when celluloid was introduced this was uh, a great improvement because it could easily be washed some of the ads though to promote celluloid were objectionable like this one where the the message was that it was going to put chinese laundries out of business because the celluloid could be just rinsed you don't have to send out your linen to the uh, uh, launderers and this was really this had racist overtones because in those days of course many laundries were indeed manned by uh, my, by the chinese and as you can see here uh, the new celluloid is is uh, uh, wreaking havoc with the uh, chinese uh, launderers uh, many materials uh, were made of of celluloid once again dice uh dolls were made of uh, celluloid uh, very very pretty as you can see uh some unusual items such as these uh, eye shades uh teeth were made of celluloid and uh it's quite obvious that this was a very 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 popular uh product and john wesley hyatt actually received the the perkin medal which is the highest honor in the US given to industrial chemists for inventions. Uh, it is, of course, named after William Henry Perkin, uh, the person who first made the first synthetic dyes in 1856 in, in England. Uh, today, there's even a John Wesley Hyatt Award, which is, as you can see, presented annually by the Society of Plastic Engineers for great achievements in the plastic industry. And I mentioned to you, that uh, in England, uh, uh, Parks had worked with Daniel Spill, who basically took over the manufacture of Parkesine, uh, renamed it Xylonite, but nevertheless, it was the same thing. <clears throat> and this is uh, where a legal battle began, because Spill, as you can see, took exception to Hyatt's claim of having in invented celluloid. And there were uh, lawsuits going back and 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 forth, and uh, eventually, uh, you know, both sides presented their cases to 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 judges, and uh, eventually the settlement was that uh, both could uh, continue to manufacture their uh, materials, and Spill uh, went on with his xylonite company in England, and Hyatt went on with his celluloid uh, manufacturing company in, in the US. A lot of money was spent on, on these legal uh, hassles. Another example of celluloid, one that you are likely to be familiar with because the whole industry was named after it, celluloid industry, of course, we're talking about the film industry. George Eastman in 1889 found celluloid to be the ideal material to be coated with photographic sensitive material with some silver compounds. Now here too, there were some interesting legalities. George Eastman would make a lot of money uh, from uh, Kodak film. Incidentally, he, he of course founded the Kodak company. He came up with the name Kodak, which has no meaning. It's not an abbreviation for anything. He just thought it sounded good. <clears throat> but there was controversy here too, because the Reverend Hannibal Goodwin 
had previously filed a patent for celluloid uh, film. Uh, this was before Eastman, and he contested e uh, Eastman's patent. And once again, there were legal wranglings here, and eventually his heirs were awarded $5 million, which at that time was quite a lot of money, but it was only 5% of Eastman's net worth. So you know that Eastman was pretty wealthy. And he was made wealthy by celluloid film. Uh, this was the original material uh, on which movie film was uh, based. The very first film was made by Thomas Edison called The Sneeze. And you, here you can see some still frames uh, from that. It lasted only a few seconds. And it was a film of an employee in uh, Edison's invention factory called uh, uh, Mel Ott, uh, who was uh, photographed. Uh, Sneezing, that was the first film on celluloid. Now Edison had an idea on how to capitalize on this. <clears throat> he invented uh, these viewers where you would look down through a lens and crank a handle and uh, watch a film. Here's a close up of that. And you can see the film on rollers and you'd crank a handle and you would watch the moving pictures. Uh, this was not one of Edison's best ideas. Uh, he thought that it would work because you would need individual machines for everyone to look at, the, at this film. Uh, he didn't uh, uh, surprisingly come up with the idea that you could project this film onto a screen so that many people could view it at the uh, same time. That invention uh, came from the Lumiere brothers in, uh, in France who invented uh, movie projection. Now there was one problem, of course, with celluloid. It was made of nitrocellulose, which means that it was highly flammable. And there were a large number of theater fires because the celluloid film would get heated up from the bulb of the projector. And if it wasn't moving fast enough, if the projector stopped for a moment, the film would catch fire. And there were a large number of devastating fires. Uh, there was one terrible one in Montreal. And some of you may remember that uh, up to the 1960s, children here were not allowed into, into movies because of the, uh, of the fire. Eventually, uh, celluloid in movie film was replaced by cellulose acetate, uh, which uh, is not flammable. Today, of course, <laughs> uh, film of all kinds is being replaced by digital photography. But of course, its history cannot be and should not be wiped away. Celluloid is no longer used today except in one item. That one item is the ping pong ball. Nobody has found a synthetic material that has the same properties, the same bounce as a celluloid ping pong ball. And you know that it's made of cellulose, you can set fire, uh, fire to it. Uh, don't do it. Take my word for it that ping pong balls are indeed made of, uh, of celluloid. Now, there's another uh, interesting connection with the flammability of, of cellulose nitrate. This takes us to France and Count Hilaire de Chardonnay, who in um, 1884, found that if you took cellulose nitrate, dissolved it in a solvent and passed it through a glass capillary tube and then treated it with some acid to take off the nitro groups, you would get a man-made fiber that looked very much like silk. And he exhibited this fiber in 1889 at the Paris Exposition, Exposition Universelle, which was also the uh, ex exposition at which the Eiffel Tower was introduced. People loved this new material, which looked just like silk. It was said to be a man-made silk. And Chardonnay actually began commercial production of this in 1891 at a factory in Besançon. But there was a problem, and I'm sure you can guess what that problem was. It was the flammability, because cellulose nitrate is highly flammable. And workers in the plant 
took to calling this novel material mother-in-law silk because it so easily became inflamed. Some of you will understand that reference. In 1901, French chemist Jacques Brandenburger was dining in a restaurant and red wine spilled onto the tablecloth. He started to wonder, could anything be done to protect fabrics from such stains? He knew that a material called viscose had been introduced in 1883 in England by Bevan and Cross. This was a material made by taking cellulose, treating it with carbon disulfide, and then regenerating it with the addition of, of acid. And the regenerated cellulose had totally different properties. They called this the intermediate viscose because it was a thick viscous material. But when it was passed through tiny holes in what is called a spinneret, it would turn into fibers which could then be woven. This material eventually would be called rayon. Anyway, uh, Brandenburger was familiar with this viscose and he wondered whether or not coating a tablecloth with viscose would protect it from stains. It didn't work well because the material did not stick to the fabric. It peeled away from it, but it peeled away in a transparent layer. Now, Brandenburger realized that he had made a discovery. He had made a thin plastic film. This material he called cellophane from cell, which is the uh, abbreviation for cellulose and fane, which came from the French word diaphane means uh, transparent. He invented a machine whereby he would take viscose and make a film out of it. And this, of course, is what came to be known as a material still widely used today. We know it as cellophane, plastic material. It became very, very popular when the Camel Cigarette Company began to wrap its cigarette packages in cellophane. Camel was a very uh, widely sold cigarette at that time. It was even advertised by doctors, believe it or not. There were ads about, uh, you know, uh, something like, uh, you know, the camels are the first choice of doctors, uh, etc. But because competitors were catching up to camel, camel wanted something novel to promote. One of the problems with tobacco is that it uh, gets moist if, if, if there's a lot of moisture in the air and doesn't burn well. Well, the DuPont company had introduced a version of cellophane that was moisture resistant. They had found a way to coat the cellophane with a very, very thin layer of nitrocellulose. That layer was so thin that that flammability was not, not a problem but it made the cellophane waterproof. And claiming that now they had a waterproof packaging that would keep the tobacco fresher longer, boosted the sales of Camel cigarettes. Cellophane did that. Cellophane became widely used as a, a wrapping material because it is translucent and it also reflects light. It has a sort of an expensive look to it. Today, cellophane can be uh, colored in all kinds of ways. And you know, it's of course still a very, very popular wrapping uh, material. There is a but here though. And the but is that the carbon disulfide that is used to make uh, viscose and that is used to make cellophane is a very toxic substance. It can uh, manifest itself as mental derangement. It's used to produce, uh, you know, as I said, rayon and cellophane. So workers are exposed to it. And the fact that that viscose releases carbon disulfide, which is toxic, has been known. In the 1800s, there already was scientific publication, as you can see here, about the problems of, of inhaling carbon uh, disulfide. So at the Courtauld Company, 
which was producing uh, viscose rayon in, in England, workers uh, were exposed to high levels of this. If you want to read some more about this, there's a fascinating book called Fake Silk, uh, because of course, rayon originally was a silk substitute. And it tells the story of the toxicity of uh, carbon disulfide, which of course we're still dealing with today because rayon is still of course produced. Another interesting connection uh, was discovered in 1933 by a surgeon, a British surgeon uh, who accidentally spilled some hot water on his shin. And he had trouble with the dressing, the dressing that he put on there would always stick to the wound. He was smoking camel cigarettes one day. And then he had the idea of taking the cellophane and using that as a covering for his wound. And that was a breakthrough. During the war, a lot of cellophane was used to cover wounds. Not only that, if you need the thicker, you needed a thick dressing on a wound, well, that was packaged in cellophane because cellophane, of course, was impervious to water. And on the bat battlefield, you know, very often you had moist, uh, moist conditions. But perhaps the material that really had the largest impact for household use was the cellulose tape. This, of course, was made of cellophane and it had glue on one side. And the, uh, the company, the 3M company that produced it, did a great deal of research in the, into this to find a way to prevent the side that didn't have the glue to sticking to the glue that, you know, as, as the tape was being wrapped around. And there's still trade secrets associated with how that was, uh, uh, that was achieved. But of course, today, uh, cellulose tape is part of every household and it has, uh, uh, all kinds of uses. But the early problem with the cellulose tape was that if you lost the end, it would stick to the rest of the tape. And it was very difficult to find because the tape was totally transparent and you couldn't see where the end was. And you had to claw with your fingernails to try to find the end. And it took, believe it or not, three years until John Borden at the 3M company was able to come up with the first tape dispenser. And the idea there was to have that little cutting edge with the serrated uh, steel that would uh, be able to uh, cut the tape and you would not lose the end of the tape. Eventually, this of course was incorporated into the uh, uh, snail design that we now have with the uh, dispensers. Uh, today, there are many, many versions of the tape. Uh, the magic tape, as it's called, is actually no longer made of, um, uh, of cellophane. It is made of cellulose acetate uh, because with that material, you can actually write on the tape. So here you have the beginnings of the, of the plastic industry which all started really uh, from uh, noticing that uh, cellulose nitrate uh, was uh, a flammable substance. That is what caused Trimbine originally to dissolve this material in alcohol and ether. That led to Alexander Parks' discovery of Parkesine, uh, John Hyatt's discovery of a substitute for ivory, and uh, the rest, as they say, is uh, history. So I hope I've interested you somewhat in the uh, history of, of plastics here. And the next time that you look at some plastic, uh, you'll appreciate the you know, fascinating background to these uh, materials. And that's it. That's our story for today. If any of you have any questions, uh, certainly about this or anything else, I'd be happy to entertain them. Please feel free to put questions in the chat or to raise your hand to be unmuted. In the meantime, I have a question. So this big fear of microplastics, you've mentioned a couple of the uh, uh, risks, but yeah. how much is there a yeah. risk? I mean, this is, this is a real issue and uh, um, you know, we've talked about this before and that really, you know, we'll do this again because I have a whole 
presentation, a follow-up presentation on plastics with all of the current issues. Uh, it, is, it is a very real problem. Uh, I mean, you know, our use today of plastics is, is tremendous. Uh, plastic bags that we use, of course, the, the you know, plastic containers for food, the, the plastic bottles that are bottled water and beverages come in. Much of that can be recycled, but unfortunately, a lot of it is thrown away. And when it gets thrown away, it ends up very often in natural water systems where it gets, uh, over the years, gets pounded by waves, gets beaten against rocks, etc., and the plastic eventually disintegrates and uh, becomes what we call microplastics, which are tiny, tiny pieces of, of plastic. So tiny that, that you can't even see them with the naked eye. But they're there, uh, mostly in the, in the ocean. And they can get into fish. And if they get into fish, they can get into us. And of course, there's the question of what is the consequence of this. And at this point, we really don't know. I mean, I think uh, it's pretty safe to conclude that, that consuming plastic is not going to be doing us any good. But whether it's harmful, that's hard to say because plastic by and large is inert material. Uh, this is one of the advantages of, you know, of the plastics that they don't react with substances. So chances are that most of the microplastic that goes into us, as it may through our diet, also comes out of us. Uh, so right now, although there is concern about the increasing amount of, of plastic in the environment, we really don't know that it is uh, harmful uh, you know, in, in, in terms of, of health. But obviously, we want to cut down. We want to cut down on the use of plastics for two reasons. One uh, is the pollution. The other is that most plastics today uh, use raw materials that come from petroleum, which is a non-renewable resource. So we want to cut down on, on that. So there are all kinds of efforts, of course, of, of making novel plastics from renewable plant materials instead of from uh, petroleum. But yes, there are issues with plastics. But everything in life has to be looked at in terms of a risk benefit analysis. And there are huge benefits of, of plastics. I mean, if you look at a hospital, a hospital could not function without plastics. Uh, everything from the masks that that are used to, to you know to to the the uh, catheters, the intravenous tubes and and uh, bags and you know I mean you just look around in hospital, everything is is made of plastic. Look into your car, everything is made of plastic. Airplanes today would be impossible without plastics because they are only they are the only hard enough and light enough materials of which you could construct uh, you know, the interior of airplanes. So it is a question of, of trying to use the plastics in the most advantageous ways uh, without polluting. Now, certainly we don't need to use so extensively the single use plastics. We don't need the straws. People can learn to drink without a straw. And if it's absolutely necessary, there are straws that can be made out of metal. Uh, there are straws that can be made of paper, although that's not much better because uh, making paper is also an environmentally unfriendly uh, uh, process. But we can certainly cut down on the uh, use of, uh, you know, the single, uh, you know, the, the forks and knives, which end up being thrown away. But, you know, we also, we want our blueberries in the middle of winter. And we wouldn't have those if we didn't have shipping containers that are made out of, uh, of plastic. Uh, the plastic bags, well, there, there's an issue that we can tackle because uh, you can just reuse reusable bags. Even the, the plastic bags can be reused. I mean, I keep a plastic bag in my pocket all the time and, and just uh, reuse it. You can reuse that dozens and dozens of times. And of course, you know, we see these horrific pictures of plastic bags in, in, in trees and in the ocean and in rivers. Plastic bags do not get up by themselves and dive into the ocean. It's people who are the problem. They put them where they should not put them. So, you know, while there are issues with plastics, there are more issues with how people discard them. That's what we have to attack. 
Thank you so much. I don't see any questions. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Joe. Thank you to everyone who's joined us today. Our next uh, presentation is on August the 1st, and the topic will be homeopathy. Thank you okay. so much. See you then. Bye, Bye everyone.